We're in part three of a series, and we're going to go someplace you wouldn't expect to go today. Because we're talking about becoming a peacemaker. But there's some things in recent events that have just gathered my attention. And, you know, as they've gathered my attention, I realized that we need to speak to those things. And we're going to talk about being a peacemaker today, but you're going to hear it from a different vein. Will you bow your head so we can hear the word this morning? Lord, we come. Uh, and you speak to us in so many different ways. Sometimes it's in an innuendo. Sometimes it's plain. Sometimes you drop something in our heart. Sometimes later on we didn't even realize a seed had been dropped there and it just comes to our memory. But Lord, what I'm asking today is that you'll speak clearly. Lord, we realize, understand, and know, not just for our nation, not just for our community, but for our families. Lord, that we need you to move. Holy Spirit, we need you to move in our homes. We need you to move in our lives. So I invite you this morning to come and do a great work in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Shelley and I had the opportunity last week to go to uh, our, our daughter's uh, golf tournament in Florida. And people say, well, y'all had a great time in Florida. We went to a golf tournament three days in Florida. <laughs> Uh, and that can be really good or really bad depending on how Abigail played. And so let's just say we had a really good day one day. Uh, and the, rest the, the rest of the days were kind of difficult and hard, but you know what? It's always good being with family. But as we traveled, uh, you know, I, I like, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. I, I like to eat. <laughs> and before we left Florida, we found this really cool Cajun restaurant. And we had breakfast at this Cajun rest restaurant, and it was out of this world. I mean, and dewy gravy. Oh, my goodness. It was, it was phenomenal. But it reminded me of a story. How, how, many, how many Cajuns do we have here with us today? Raise your hand. There they are. Uh, about Boudreaux. He lived across DeBio from Clarence. Uh, and uh, he didn't like Clarence at all. And they used to yell back and forth across the bio. And Boudreaux would say, if I ever get a chance to cross this bio, I'm going to come over there and beat you up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this went on for years. Finally, the state built a bridge across that bio right there by their houses. And Boudreaux's wife, Marie, said, now's your chance, Boudreaux. Why don't you go over there and beat Clarence up like you say? Boudreaux say, okay, and he start across the bridge, but he see a sign on the bridge, and he stopped and read it, then he go back home. Marie say, why are you back so soon, Boudreaux say. Marie, I done changed my mind about beating up that Clarence. You know, Marie, they got a sign on that there bridge that say, Clarence, 13 feet, 6 inches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story out of history. Some of you may be well aware of it. I realize, even for my children and them going to school, that sometimes our, our kids don't get the full scope of history. And they get a different perspective and understanding. We're going to go back to the year of 1937. The British Prime Minister's name is Neville Chamberlain. And, and rather than challenging the acts of an aggressive Nazi regime in Germany, Chamberlain sought to pacify Adolf Hitler, and he signed the Munich Pact of 1938, which gave parts of Czechoslovakia to Germany. Uh, some have speculated that his desire was to keep the peace, was somewhat driven by uh, Britain being outmatched by Germany's military at the time. Chamberlain seemed to have underestimated Hitler's ambition. In March of 1939, Hitler violated the Munich Pact by invading Czechoslovakia. Britain and France then agreed to protect Poland later that month, and Hitler would eventually, eventually invade and occupy much of Europe, then begin an air war on England, listen, killing thousands of innocent British citizens. 
You say, Pastor, why are you telling this story? Because we're talking about being peacemakers. Because sometimes you have to have war to have peace. There are times in our lives where you have to, before you can have peace, you have to have war. And I want you to understand something, and I'm going to make an important point here today as it applies to our society and us as a whole. Peace is not complacency. Because we live in a world where there's not a real problem until the bomb goes off in our house. Uh, we can see the bomb, we know the bomb is there, but it's not a really a problem until it goes off. And then we say, oh my goodness, there's a bomb in this world. We've been reading after, after Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9, Jesus speaking, and he said, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. But I want you to understand something today that's important for all of us to get. There is one that is more evil and diabolical than Hitler. And we put up with his ways too long. John 10.10 10 speaks of him. Jesus says this. The thief's purpose is to steal and what? And what? His purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. Later, the apostle Paul writes in Romans 6, 23, he says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, this is where Neville Ch Chamberlain made a mistake. He made a mistake believing that he could make peace with a lying tyrant. Can I tell you how many Christians make the same mistake believing that they can make a pact with the devil and it's okay and play with sin and it's all going to work out okay. And I will tell you today, so here where we're going with this, we will never be at peace or be peacemakers as long as we pacify sin. You say, Pastor, where is all this coming from? And I'll be honest with you. This week, some of you have seen on the news, on your Facebook pages about our local high school and some of the events that have gone on there, and I have looked in the faces of parents who are terrified, petrified, and fearful for their children. And yet we see something that many of you know is not unusual in any of the high schools as we understand because it happens a lot. But it doesn't become an issue until there's an issue and it affects us. And it typifies our world, it typifies us as Christians oftentimes because we ask the question, can we sit back and continue to allow sin to destroy our families, our schools, and our communities? Or here's a better question, and it affects me in the church. Can we afford to risk offending people by calling sin, sin? Because we live in a world, this is where it's all about. Let's not offend anyone. Let's keep the peace. But are we being Neville Chamberlain saying we're keeping the peace? Let's not offend everyone, but let's appease everyone. And I was reminded yesterday as I was reading my word in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3. I'd like for you to turn there with me. Because the Apostle Paul deals with, he's writing to people in the church and he's giving them direction as it pertains to our lives and how we live our lives. And he says these words that are so important and we need to hear them today. It says, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins, let me read that again so some of you are turning there. Let there be no sexual immorality impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. You've just excluded most of our entertainment. Right. 
obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking, that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. And this is what he says, For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Can I tell you something today? And this includes every person in this room, men, women, and children. There is going to be a day of judgment for all of us. And God is a just God, and he's not going to allow anything to slide. There is a judgment given to those that do not believe in Jesus. And their eternal punishment will be a life without God, an eternal life without God. But there is also a day of judgment, the word God says, for people who believe. What have you done now with what you know? And then he continues, he says, don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. As we read this, we understand this to be very clear. There is a line of separation. Secondly, the justice and judgment of God are real. You say, Pastor, don't talk about that. That scares me. And you understand something. We haven't talked about it because it scares people. We haven't talked about the sin and the weight of sin and the effects of sin and how it impacts our family and our children and our grandchildren and the generation that's going to happen should Jesus tarry and we're not here anymore. What's going to happen then? And I realize this. And it comes back to speak to what Pastor Shelley was speaking about this morning when she got up and said, you may be here this morning and you may be under the great weight of condemnation that many of us that live in the world that we live in and come to church and we want to love God, we're caught in a trap. And out of this trap of our sin, we feel like hypocrites and our hypocrisy condemns us and it makes us weak as leaders. Can I tell you the truth today? And, and we're going to let everybody not off the hook, but everybody have a greater understanding. Everyone in this place has sinned. L let me say it again. Everyone in this place has sinned. Let me take that a little deeper. Everyone in this place has sinned this last week. And while we have this great understanding theologically of what Christ has done for us, that he was a propitiation for our sin, uh, and he's came to take away our sin, we also understand this lingering effect and this peace pact that we try to make with sin. That we believe God to understand our sin, in spite of the fact that he sent his only begotten son to die for our sin, we're still trying to make this peace pact. And what we understand and we see all the time is this, is innocent lives still suffer at the hands of a wicked tyrant. And I'm talking about Satan today. Innocent lives still suffer at the hands of a weak, wicked tyrant. And so the Word of God tells us this. In Jude, verse number 3, there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. If you have a difficult time finding it, you can turn to the really scary book, which is the book of Revelation, and go one book up. I mean, you want to see people get nervous in church, you get a pastor to get up and say, we're going to preach out of Revelation today, and people begin to get nervous. See, I have a mandate as a pastor, and this is what Pastor Mackey told me years ago. He said... I don't care about your presentation or your content. The only thing I care about is that when God tells you to do something, that you're obedient. Now, stay with me for just a moment. We are a technology-driven society. 
We, we love new technology. Somebody say amen. I, I'm right there with you. But we're also a society that more so every day we're becoming more biblically ignorant. And I will tell you this. There comes a time and day where they're going to introduce this new technology. They're going to call it something different. They're not going to call it the mark of the beast. It's going to be for your betterment and good. That they're going to place these little tracking chips underneath your hands and on your forehead and uh, satellite can now keep up with every person on the planet and there will be no need for any social programs because or credit cards because everything will be provided for you. And can I tell you, there will be a lot of Christians that take the mark or so-called Christians. Because you know why? Because we're not willing to deal with the issue we're dealing with today. That there's a bomb in our house, there's a bomb in the room. And until you realize and understand what that bomb is and the consequence of that bomb and how to take care of it, one of these days it's going to explode. And on that day, it happens often, we, we hear it. People make an appointment, they come and see myself or Pastor Glenn or one of the other pastors and they say, my children aren't living for God. Can you believe they're doing this? This has happened in my home. Our family is a wreck. And you understand, I want you to get this picture. That doesn't just happen. There's a bomb and we don't address it and we don't look at it and we don't understand and we're making a peace pact to say this is the way the world is and everybody's this way and you know what, and aren't I entitled to have my time and aren't I entitled to have fun and boy, we've, we've got all kinds of good excuses. Jude verse number three says, dear friends, listen to this. I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you. Listen to this, urging you. Another translation says, begging you to contend or defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. And he says, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows them to live immoral lives. You have to fight for the faith. You have to understand that the wage of sin always equals death, that you can't play with it. You can't contend and say, I've made peace with it. It's just how it is. It's how the world is. It's how it's going to be. You understand, you're playing with a ticking time bomb. Then we wake up one day and we see the effects of it in our community and we say, how has this happened? See, there is a time, the Word of God says, there's a time to fight. And there's often times to understand in order to have peace, there often has to be a war. And you have to deal with the tyrant that wants to destroy both you and your family. Well, why do we have to defend the faith? You understand why we have to defend it? Because every day it's under attack. Did everybody hear what I said? Every day it's under attack. There is no peace accord that's going to keep sin from destroying us. In order, to have, in order to have peace, we have to declare war. And to, so today, we're going to declare war. Listen to me. Today, we're going to declare war for your marriage. 
for, for your children, for your life, for, for the sins that you so are entangled by and you feel like that you'll never be able to live for God and you wonder if you're really even saved today. And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture and we're going to discover how to do this today. And when we leave this place, we're not going to learn anything new. Did you hear what I said? When we leave here today, we're not going to learn anything new. But we're going to realize that there are some old ways that we need to embrace again. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Philippi, he says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, say, say it with me, pray about what? Everything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. You say, Pastor, if I prayed about everything, I would be praying all the time. Maybe that's a good idea. Amen. It says, tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done, then you will experience God's peace. We've said it. You can't be a peacemaker if you don't have the peace of God which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me. Everything you've heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. So let's look at number one today. Shelly and I were having a conversation at dinner the other day, and I was vexed by current events in our community. Sorrowful because... I pastored this community for for 23 years. Taking responsibility in and of myself for the lack of impact that we might have made in our community. Asking God what we can do differently. And my wife, she gave the answer as she does oftentimes, not in a profound way, but just in a simple way. She said, Alan, we have forgotten to pray. We try to live our Christian lives without ever praying. And the only time that there ever ever is prayer is when there is something that's difficulty or the bomb has exploded. And then we say, let's pray now. But we just read that as Christians, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, that we are to be people of prayer. Not as a word of condemnation today. You understand, I'm not, that's the last thing I'm trying to do today. But if we were to examine our schedule and all the things that we do, prayer would probably fall way down on the bottom of the list. It's just that we have busy lives and there are things going on. And yet the Bible says we need to defend our faith. And the first line of defense in in defending our faith is prayer. You say, Pastor, how how, how do we pray? First and foremost, I, I believe that it's important that we make time for God. Let me say it again. I believe it's important that we make time for God. The other religions of the world think that American Christians are a joke. We may not understand their ways and their prayer rugs and their regimen of prayer, but they laugh at us when we say we pray on the way to work. Because our lack of commitment for the God that we believe to be the great God, the Savior of our soul, the one who provides all of eternity for us, is limited to a time and place where it's most convenient for us. Amen. 
We have to pray. Let me say it again. We have to pray. I'm not making this optional today. I'm not making it to a place where, okay, let's feel better about this, and if we do a little bit, it's okay. You understand something. That's what we're doing, and it's not okay. We have to pray. And if it begins and ends with me, my first prayer and where it comes is the repentance of things in my life and where I'm at and who I am and the things that I've seen and have encountered and what's going on in me. And there has to be a true sense to understand something that I want to be clean and I want to please God. Prayer has to begin with repentance. You understand something. We can march into prayer. But without repentance, we don't come humbly. And the Word of God says that when James, when we don't come humbly before God, listen to me, He doesn't hear our prayers. So we begin with repentance. Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says we should begin to pray and give God thanks for all He has done. You know, I can start by saying today, I'm so glad that Jesus has forgiven me. How do I know? Because I've asked him this morning. You say, you're the pastor of this church. You're supposed to be perfect. I'm not. I I am far from perfect. And I come and say, I'm so sorry. But as I begin to pray and I begin to ask for forgiveness, I get the freedom and I begin to pray for my wife and I begin to pray for my family and my children. Uh, And then, then I begin to pray for our community. You understand, we're real good at complaining about things, but we're not real good at prayer. We're real good at posting stuff on Facebook. We're not real good at prayer. If we spent half the time in prayer that we spend in social media we would be reaching heaven and God would be changing our communities. We pray for our community. We pray for our nation. We pray as the Bible commands us for wisdom and strength. Because I'm going to ask you a question. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, how many of you here today lack wisdom? And he says that if we will ask believing uh, and not wavering, if we'll ask believing that God will give us wisdom. That means God has answers to all the dilemmas that are going on in our lives and in the lives of our children and in the lives of our community. If we'll ask Him for wisdom, He will give us wisdom. But here we are floundering, trying to figure it out on our own. So first and foremost, we have to become a people of prayer. So I'm going to stop right now, and I'm going to encourage you. Listen to me. It never happens if you don't plan it. Did you hear what I just said? You can leave this place today, and you say, well, this is a good message, and I'm going to try to pray. And I'm going to tell you something. Nothing is going to change. Until before you leave this place today that you vow and resound in your heart to say, okay, God, I'm going to give you 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes before I go to bed. You say, well, that's 15 minutes of sleep that I'm going to miss. It's 15 minutes of defense that you're putting up around your family and your lives and your community. Do you want your children to be defenseless? No. We have to pray. Amen. We don't need to wait till when we get to life group to pray with our life group. Well, we don't need to wait till we get to church to pray with the pastor. We need to have prayed before we ever got to church. Amen. We need to pray. And so what I'm telling you today is this. If you don't plan it, it won't happen. Before you leave this place today, you have to vow to say to your husband and wife to hold you accountable. To your friend or neighbor 
to the person and say, you know what, I'm committing myself to prayer. I'm committing it to it. And it's okay if you ask me. It's okay if you ask me, did you make your commitment in prayer today? You say, Pastor, that sounds like bondage. I just need somebody nagging me about one more thing. Can I tell you something? It may be the most important thing that you need somebody nagging you about. We need to return to prayer, number one. The Bible says this, and the Apostle Paul says, is that we need to fix our thoughts. See, the greatest battlefield is our mind. And he says that I want you to begin to think about these things. What is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. And you don't find that on Facebook. You don't find that on the television. He says, fix your mind. You understand something. You can never defend until first and foremost, you fix your thoughts on the right things. True and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. I, I memorized a scripture growing up, Proverbs 3.37. New Living reads it differently. Uh, the way I learned it in New King James, it says, for as a, King James says it for as a man thinks, but New King James says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And what that means is this. What you fix your thoughts upon, you will become. What you fix your thoughts upon, you will become. So you understand something. Here, here we are 50 years in the making of modern media as we know it that we all love, and, and, and I like it as well. Man, I watch ball games, and, and I sit and uh, enjoy things with my family. But what we have misunderstood is this, is that there is a great education process that happens not only with the world as we know it, for people in the church, and we have been snookered in the same way. That there are things that the Bible outlines and calls directly as sin. And if we were to take a poll in this place today, that there would be many of you that would be asked if some of these things were sin, and you would check a box to say, I don't know if it is or not. And yet we believe the Word of God to be unchanging, and we believe Him to be unchanging. And yet somewhere in the last 50 years, our mind about those things has changed. How did that come about? Because there has been a modern education that has happened through entertainment. Can I tell you something? It happens on the Disney Channel. You say, well, it's safe. My kids are watching the Disney Channel. Can I tell you something? It happens on the Disney Channel. And you know what? When they're getting more of the Disney Channel than they are the Word of God, you wonder why they have conflicted interest and they no longer believe what this says. Because the Disney Channel has become their new authority. See, what you fix your thoughts upon, you'll become. And many of us, including myself, we have destroyed our thought life, allowing others to think for us. If I read contentious material that incites anger, anger I will become angry. If I, read, if I watch something that incites lust, I will become lustful. If I watch something continually that incites violence, that speaks to the community, if I watch something that incites violence, I will become violent. It's my first reaction. Because it's what I've seen in movies. 
that if I'm going to deal with the situation, the best way to deal with it is to deal with it in violence. So we have to change the way we think. Once again, let me put this point into play. If you don't plan to change these things in your life, you will not. If you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. That means if you and your husband and wife, if y'all can't come in agreement after church today, say, you know what? Well, we don't need to watch so much television. Maybe we need to go to the park and hang out and talk. You know, we, we wonder why marriages are in trouble in this country because the number one dating activity is movies. How much communication do you do in a movie? <laughs> and we love each other. And love is just nothing more than lust. And then we get married and we have to talk to one another. What do we do then? And then we have married couples coming and they tell us, well, I didn't know them because when they begin to talk about what they believe, I don't believe anything they believe. <laughs> you mean you dated, for, you dated for a year and you don't know anything this person believes? Number three. The Apostle Paul says, put it into practice. Talk is cheap. Now, we know the indictment, and so we need to hear it, and we need to hear it loud and clear today. The world views the church. In fact, I heard someone say the other day, Shelley was reading me a quote out of a book of a man who desired to become a Christ follower and desired to serve the one true God. He said, but he attended church for a matter of months and left because what he discovered is the people in the church were the same as the people in the world. Wow. He said, I thought they served the one true God that made them overcomers. But they were no different. They told the same dirty jokes. They watched the same things everybody else did. They went to the same places and just hid it better than anybody else. He said, put it into practice. Now, this is the part that you have to understand. Putting something into practice always involves the intentional. Putting something in practice always involves the intentional. My friend Jimmy Williams, he, he has helped me and helped Shel Abigail with, with her golf game over the years, and he caddied on tour, and he's a, gr he's a great golf teacher. And I'll never forget the first lesson I ever had with him. He discovered me out on the range, and I had one of these super buckets of balls. And I was sitting there hitting ball after ball, and he said, what are you doing? I, I said, I'm practicing. He said, no, you're not. I, I said, he said, what's the intention, to get better? He said, well, you're not, and you won't. I said, aren't you Mr. Positive? He said, no, I'm just not stupid. Because you are reinforcing the same stupid mistakes every time that you do that, and you're out here hitting a large bu bucket reinforcing those mistakes. That's not practice. That's how he says things, too. If you know him, that's how he says things. And I, I said, Well, what should I do different? He said, You should be intentional. There's some changes you need to make, and unless you make those changes and you focus on those changes, those things are never going to change. I said, well, what do I need to change? He said, first and foremost, you need to do this. And he said, you need to hit that whole bucket of ball just working on this one thing. I said, hold on just a second. That's going to be boring. Who wants to do that? Do you want to change? See, change doesn't happen overnight. We'd like to have the shundai. We'd like to have the preacher pray for us and woo, everything's different. <laughs> we'd like to have the one diet pill that takes off the 50 pounds that we've been trying to lose all those years. But you know what? It doesn't happen. 
You go to the doctor and he says, don't eat this and go to the gym. Oh, I don't want to do that. And the Apostle Paul says, you have to put it into practice. You, you have to practice the intentional. That means what the Holy Spirit moves upon your heart today to say, you can't do that or you need to do this. Because what you, the Bible says this. It says, you don't just quit evil, you replace evil with good. Yeah. Overcome evil with good. That's what Romans says. It doesn't say just quit evil. It says overcome evil by doing good. So you understand something. If you're going to practice, it's not enough to say, well, I don't want to do this anymore. What are you going to do to replace that? Or are you going to do something for your neighbors? Are you going to be nice to your wife? There's a start. So what you need to do, here we are again. Take one point of conviction this morning. I'm not telling you to take three points of conviction. I want you to pray. Believe me, and I want you to fix your thoughts. But take one point of conviction today and be accountable. Find somebody that you can trust to be accountable with and say, you know what? This is what God is speaking to me, and I need your help. Because if you leave it in darkness, you'll never grow beyond it. Bring it into the light. James says, confess your faults one to another. Well, we dare not do that. That would be a scary place to go. You say, Pastor, this is why you have life groups. You already got that. This is why we have life groups. And we hold them to high confidentiality. Because it ought to be a place of accountability that we can come and share and say, you know what, this is what God is dealing with me about. Not what God is dealing with, or what God needs God to do in my husband or my wife. This is what God is dealing with, and I need some accountability in this process. I need you to ask me, how are you doing with this? Be accountable. Here's number two in that. If you're going to be intentional, avoid pitfalls. You understand something? If you're an alcoholic, you don't need to be hanging out at the bar. Amen. I mean, you think that's stupid for me to say that, but I'm going to tell you something. I know a lot of people that have convinced themselves to say, you know what? That's where my social setting is, and that's where all my friends are, and they keep falling into the same pitfall. If you want to avoid the pitfall and do a change, quit going to the bar. And he ends this, and he says, then, here we go again. After you do these things, after you pray, after you think about these things, and after you put it in practice, then the God of peace will be with you. Wow. Defend your faith. Pray. Fix your thoughts. Come on now. Put it into practice. Pray. Fix your thoughts. Put it into practice. Come on, say it with me. Pray, Pray, fix your thoughts, put it into practice. Well, let's pray. Father, we start with ourselves today. We know our failures. We know our pitfalls, not as well as you do. We know the condemnation that haunts us because here we are at church. And we want to serve you and we realize that we're not even talking to you or allowing you to talk to us. But Lord, we come today because we want those things to change. We don't want you to steal. We don't want the enemy to come and steal, kill, and destroy from our life, from our family, from our community, from our nation any longer. And so, Lord, we ask that you place in us the wherewithal, the awareness, Lord, even, even the severity of the situation that we may be in. 
Holy Spirit, you are the revealer of truth, but you are the revealer of things that are unseen. And so, Father, I ask that through your Spirit today that you come in the hearts and minds of people and reveal the bomb in their home. Lord, that today we declare war and we are going to defend the faith. But we can't do it without you. We don't have the power. We don't have the ability. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and help us. There are many people here that have been beat down all their lives and they don't have it in themselves to do it. But, Holy Spirit, you are great. Lord, let us become people of prayer. Help us to change the way we think. Help us to put in practice what you're teaching us. With every head bowed, where every eye closed, with nobody looking around, you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm one of those people. I, I'm not certain whether I'm right with God, whether I'm living for God or not. But today, I, I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ. I want to be a follower of Jesus. If that's you, it doesn't matter if you come to church all your life. If you're in that place today, will you raise your hand and I'm going to pray a very sincere prayer with you this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands going up all over the place. People that are saying, I, I want to be different and I want to be a difference maker. Lord, we ask as we raise our hands that you not just convict us of our sin, but you bring the power to change us today through your Son, Jesus Christ. We come by uplifted hand and we give you our sin. We say, Lord, we are sorry. But even beyond being sorry and asking for your forgiveness, we want you to know our heart. And our heart says we never, ever, ever, ever want to go back and be like that ever again. But we can't do that without you because we're going to hit these doors and be tempted as soon as we hit these doors today. So, God, we give our lives to you, and we, we allow, Jesus, you to be the ultimate authority in our life, above, above our past, above our present, and above our future. You are the authority, and we will declare today that we will be obedient to you, and we will declare to others today that we will be obedient to you. And we pray these things today, believing in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. One name is higher. One name is strong.